dancing lessons. Maybe you'd like to take an improvisational theater class. Maybe you'd like to do stand-up comedy. All kinds of wonderful things you can do, but you've got to schedule them into your life. Health and fitness goals. Do you know what your cholesterol level is? Have you got a goal for that? Do you have a goal for maybe competing in a marathon or a biathlon or a triathlon? Or maybe uh, one year in my health and fitness goals was to get rid of my toenail fungus. Any of you ever have that yellow toenail fungus? And most people just settle for it. Oh, it's old guy's toe disease. Nothing you can do about it. Well, if you take olive leaf extract long enough, you can get rid of it. And that became my goal, one of my goals for the year. So health and fitness goals. Relationships goals. How many of you have written goals for the next year about what you want to accomplish in the area of relationships? Just curious. See a show of hands. Not too many. One year, mine was create five new male friends. We just moved to Santa Barbara. And what happens for most men is you move, to, if you have kids, you move to a new town. Your wife goes and takes the kids to school. Your kids form friends. Your wife gets to know the parents of your kids' friends, and that becomes your social network. And I didn't like any of the husbands of my wife's new friends. They just didn't interest me. And none of them were into personal growth. None of them were meditating. None of them had a sense of larger purpose in the world. They just were boring to me. And so I made a goal to have five really close friends by the end of the year. So it wasn't just casual, it was a deliberate intention. And as a result of that, a strategy came up when I was meditating a couple weeks later. And every two weeks, I invited someone to have lunch with me. Started with a guy who was a, a football, I mean, a wrestling coach at UCSB. And then turned out, who knew, the police chief of our town's a really cool guy. Someone mentioned that, I had lunch with him, really ended up becoming very close friends and so on and so forth. So now I have guys I play poker with, people we uh, play bowls, which is a fun game, like, you know, bocce ball kind of thing. I have other people that I meditate with and we do personal growth things together and so forth and so on. But it was a specific goal for the year in terms of relationships. And then the area of personal. Personal would be personal growth, emotional growth, things you want to do that grow you. It could be learning to play the piano. It could be learning French. We heard Art Linkletter speaking, I think, like nine languages. So what are your goals in the personal area? And then finally, have a vision for your life in terms of contribution and legacy. I want to, I want to share a story about this part. There's a man named Kenneth Baring who used to be a co-owner of the Seattle Seahawks. He was worth about $500 million at the time. I don't know what his net worth is now. It's probably increased. And he said his life went through four stages. The first stage was called stuff. He said, I wasn't happy, and I figured if I had a lot of stuff, I'd be happy. So he got a lot of money, made a lot of money, bought a lot of stuff. He had a private plane, a private yacht. He had the big house. He had the fancy cars. He had everything he wanted, art collections, great wine from around the world. And he said, I still wasn't happy. Well, I figured I had, maybe I needed better stuff. So he said, the next stage of my life, I just bought a bigger plane, a bigger yacht, a better house, better wine, more expensive this. I still wasn't happy. And he said, well, maybe I was collecting the wrong stuff. And so I created the phase of my life called Different Stuff. And that's when he said, I bought the Seattle Seahawks. He said, maybe if I own a professional football team, that'd make me happy. He said, I still wasn't happy. And then he got a call from a friend who said, I'm going to go over to Bosnia and we're going to take a plane full of wheelchairs and all these kids that have either been born malformed or have lost their legs to landmines, we're going to give them wheelchairs because wheelchairs give them mobility and freedom. And so he got in the plane with his friend and they flew over to Bosnia and he got off and they were putting all these kids in wheelchairs. And he said, I picked up this first kid. He was about 11 years old, very, didn't weigh much. He was real thin. And I put him in a wheelchair and I went to turn away to get another wheelchair and a kid wouldn't let go of me. I turned back around. I looked down and there was tears coming down his face. And he said, please don't go yet. And through an interpreter, he said, I just want to look at your face so I can memorize it. So when we meet again in heaven, I'll be able to thank you one more time. And he said, I started to cry uncontrollably. And he said, it was the first time in my life I felt pure joy. And as a result, Ken came back and he started the Wheelchair Foundation. They've given away over 400,000 wheelchairs to kids around the world. And he said, I've never been happier in my life. And now... And now he's created a new foundation because one of the biggest problems in the world is lack of clean water. We have thousands and thousands of people with all kinds of diseases and cataracts, all because they don't have clean water. And so he started a new foundation. He said, I've never been happier in my life, and he calls this last stage of his life purpose. And he actually wrote a book called A Life of Purpose. The point being, and several people have said this, the real joy comes from giving. 
Bob Proctor, I know, will talk tomorrow about this. I, I love this idea. He said, it's critical that you make a lot of money. He said, money is very useful. He said, without money, the good you can do is limited to your physical presence. See, I can show up at a homeless shelter and I can hold kids and I can read stories and I can brush people's hair and I can do lots of stuff, but it's limited to my physical presence. But when you have money, as Mark does and I do and many of the speakers up here do, we give away millions of dollars. We planted over a million trees in Yosemite National Forest, figuring we certainly used up a lot making books. So we thought we ought to put a few back into the ground. It's actually cool to go there and see all these little trees growing up and go, that's our trees. It's really neat. But the point being that you want to have influence for good. You know, Mark talks about creating enlightened millionaires, millionaires that give away at least a million dollars. And if you create a million millionaires that give away a million dollars, you're talking about a trillion dollars in philanthropy in the world. That's not so hard to do. It's really not that big a game to play if you really think about how simple it is. All right. So we've got these seven vision categories. What I'd like to do with you for just a moment is I'd like you to close your eyes and trust that your stuff won't blow away in the wind here. And I'm going to mention each of these categories. I'm going to be silent for 30 seconds. And what I'd like you to do is just let come up from you, from the internal natural child, from your inner self, your high self, the part of you that knows what you really want, to come up with, what do I really want in that arena of my life? And I would say, think in terms of the next two years. So two years from now, what would you like to say you've accomplished financially or career-wise or so forth? So just a little bit of going inside so you're not listening to me and just being a speech will kind of just take it inside a little deeply. So take a deep breath, close your eyes. And take another deep breath and just let it all go. You can feel the wind on your face. A little bit of moisture. Remember, whatever it rains, it's cleansing, it's cleaning, cleaning out the old, bringing in the new. In Hawaii, they say, whenever it rains, it's auspicious. It's the God's way of blessing the event. So we're going to get a real blessing now. So think of the area of financial. What do you truly want in your deepest heart, financially for yourself, Two years from now, what would you like to have accomplished? What's your vision for that? And then think about the area of business and career. What do you want to accomplish? What's your vision for what you will have been able to achieve two years from now? And then focus on the area of fun and recreation. Two years from now, what do you want to say you've done or experienced in terms of really having fun or recreation, travel, anything in that arena. And then think about the area of health and fitness. What do you want to have accomplished in that area of your life? Maybe it's weight loss. Maybe it's more vitality, more flexibility. Maybe a better diet that you're now eating. Then think about the area of relationships. What do you want to have accomplished in the area of relationships? And then think about the area of personal. What do you want to have accomplished just because you want to do it in terms of personal growth or development, spiritual development, education? And then finally, the area of contribution. Where do you want to volunteer? Where do you want your money to go? What do you want to be different in the world because of your efforts? Very good. Then go ahead when you're ready, open your eyes, come on back. And when you have a moment, perhaps not now because it's a little challenging, but make sure you write that down. Get it down on paper. Share it with your partner. Put it up on the refrigerator. Look at it every day. What I do is I have three goals in every one of those arenas. So I have 21 goals every year. And then I make a eight and a half by 11 sheet with a picture. I either get it from, you know, Google Images or I pull them out of magazines and I put them under a page protector and I write a little affirmation over it with a specific measurable goal. Then each day I go through that and I look at it and I visualize it and I feel the feelings I would feel if I already had it. 
And every year I achieve at least 18 of those 21 goals. And within two years, the ones I didn't get, the three that I didn't get, I have achieved. I could go back over my life. Everything I've ever wanted has come true. Everything. Now, I'm still working on bigger goals like transforming education, world peace, ending hunger. But those are all moving along quite nicely in terms of the measurements that we're doing in the world of those things. Now, the next step, obviously, and we won't do that here either, but you've got to set measurable goals. How much by when? Want to be wealthier? How much? Be specific. So I'd like to double my income because I will earn $350,000 by midnight, December 31st, 2008 at 5 p.m. Specific. I'd like to become a millionaire. I will have a net worth of one million by midnight, December 31st, 2009 at 5 p.m like to lose weight and get fit. Might be I will weigh 190 pounds, complete a 10K run by December 30th, 2007. Now, I want to look at the law of attraction with you just a little bit. We know the law of attraction works like gravity, which is always. I just got asked the other day, we were filming a PBS special. It's going to be a pledge drive special. I was in Boston doing that yesterday. And one of the questions that got asked from the audience was, well, what about Darfur? And what about Katrina? And what about 9-11? I'm now coming to believe, and I didn't believe this three years ago, but as more I study law of attraction and hang out with the other people teaching it, I'm now beginning to believe that everything is attracted into our life, either by our behavior, by our thoughts, by our fears, by our fantasies, the things we talk about, the things we watch on TV, and we go, oh, I hope that never happens to me, or we watch a movie like Blood Diamond and we see all this violence over diamonds and we get really upset about it, we actually create more of everything we have intense feelings about. So literally, I want you to act as if you're creating everything and become really, 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 really disciplined about what you think, what you read, what you watch, what you talk about. I was with Mark Victor Hansen in New York about all oh, three months ago. We were getting some awards for books, some convention, and uh, we, we went out to dinner afterwards about 10 o'clock, and we talked till about 2 in the morning. And literally, in that four hours, neither one of us said one negative thing about anything or anybody. Mark told me the projects he was working on, and I went, that's fabulous. How can I help you? You need to meet this person. I just met that person. You guys need the network. It was all about how do we do it? Where do we do it? What's happening? What's good? What's good news? Mark was saying, wow, we can educate a kid in Africa for $120 a year. We can send him to college in Africa. I didn't know it was that cheap. You could do that. We talked about microloans. We talked about educating. We talked about some research that shows the fastest way to end hunger in the world is to educate young girls in rural villages. Who knew the research? But it's there. So literally, we just guess, yes, yes. How do we do it? Then I get on the plane the next morning to fly back to LA, and the guy next to me is talking about how crappy the world is, how bad his children are, the government, this thing is bad. Never occurred to us once to have a negative thought. It was all about what do we want? Let's make it happen. How can we help each other? You go. And so basically, that's what you want to be doing, only focusing and talking about exactly what you want. When you talk about something's not working, all you're going to do is create more of it's not working. People come up to me and say, I've been doing the law of attraction for three months. I still don't have my cards. It doesn't work. Well, what you're focusing on is it doesn't work. And you're going to get more of it doesn't work. What you want to focus on is where it is working. Hey, I wanted to get a place by the window at the restaurant, and I got it. You know, some people keep what they call a manifestation journal. At the end of every day, what, man what did I manifest? Well, how's it working? And what we know is what we focus on what? It expands. And so you want to focus on only that which what you, is what you want. Okay. Whatever you think about, talk about, and fantasize about, or give your attention to, you're going to attract more of. So you really have to become deliberate and intentional. Now, three stages we talked about. Ask, believe, and receive. So I want to move into the next section here. In a moment, we're going to talk about ask, believing, and we're talking about creating a vibrational match for that which you want into your life. You must always be feeling good. Anytime you're feeling good, you attract more into your life to feel good about. When you're feeling bad, when you're upset, when you're pissed off, when you're resentful, when you're scared, when you're in doubt, you're actually pushing away all the things that are waiting to come into your life. Most of what you want is kind of sitting out there in the parking lot waiting to come in, but when you're talking about negativity and you're criticizing other people, it's pushing it away. And the faster you can get over that, the faster you'll manifest stuff, stuff into your life. So the more we can be in gratitude and abundance, 
Let's talk about gratitude for a minute. When you watched the movie The Secret, you saw about the gratitude rock that Lee Brower uses in his life. John D. Martini never gets out of bed until he has a tear of gratitude. Sometimes he says, I'm in there for an hour, just focusing on what I'm grateful for. But until that tear comes out of my eye, I do not get out of bed. And John is a millionaire, probably 100 times over. Started out as a dyslexic kid. He was basically dying when this person took him under his wing and gave him an affirmation, which was something like to the effect of, I am a wise person and everyone I touch is benefited by my wisdom. And now John has read every book ever written by any Nobel laureate in any field in the last 10 years. And he's a genius at what he does. Whereas before they said, you got to drop out of school, you're ADD. And at 14, he dropped out of school. Gratitude. Rhonda Byrne, when she wrote the book, The Secret, she said, I didn't start to write until I was, had so much gratitude in my heart that I would have a tear come down my face. She said, as soon as I was in that space, I could, my fingers were just flying. In a book, she wrote that book in like three weeks. Three weeks, wrote a book that sold over 3.75 million copies because she was in the space to receive. Because when you're in a space of gratitude, you're saying, I accept that which has been given to me. I appreciate it. And what that does, it opens up a space for more to flow in. The word grace, we say we're under grace, you know, the grace of God. The word gracias in Spanish, gratitude, it's all from the same root word. The more gratitude we have, the more grace we receive that flows through us out into the universe in terms of our creativity and drawing to us that which we want. Abundance and generosity. You want to be always giving as much as you can. Barbara talked about that hugely today. Be in a state of joy. I now teach that at least one hour a day you need to take for yourself and do the things that you most love to do. Right now, I'm learning to play the piano, so that's what my hour is about. For my wife, it's the horse poop and petting our dog and our cats and all of that stuff. She loves it. I don't, she just does. Um, for someone else, it's listening to Bach or Beethoven or listening to Bono or whatever it might be. For someone else, it's painting or gardening. I was doing a seminar up in Canada, and actually, I was actually on a TV show up in Canada, and this woman stood up in the audience, and she said, I have a question. I said, great, what is it? She said... I haven't been happy for seven years. You're talking about joy. I haven't, been, I haven't experienced joy for seven years. I said, what happened seven years ago? She said, my husband died. I said, really? I said, what did you used to do that brought you joy before your husband died? She said, well, I used to paint. I used to garden. I used to play the piano. And I said, have you done any of that in the last seven years? She says, no. I said, well, here, go, to, go home. And tonight, I want you to play the piano. Tomorrow, I want you to go out and garden, and the next day, I want you to buy some paints and paint something. Then I want you to write me a letter or give me a phone call, and I gave her my card. And about a week later, I got a call, and she said, I can't tell you how happy I am. Happiness partly comes from doing things that make you happy. And for some reason, most of us spend our time doing the things we think we should do, and we don't go out and do the things that make us happy. So literally, make a discipline of doing the things that bring you joy. It's like having a joy diet. And basically, if you can get into joy all the time, like Mother Teresa was, or the Dalai Lama is, or Mark Victor Hansen is 90% of the time, and I am 90% of the time, then things just start flowing into your life at a magical rate. Okay, forgiveness is another big piece. You must forgive, because anytime you're holding resentment, you're not in joy, you're not in love, you're not in inner peace. You have to let go and release. And there are all kinds of powerful processes. John Gray wrote a book about the total truth process. If you can feel it, you can heal it. There's a book on, um, on letting go of, uh, of, of uh, on forgiveness by Jerry Jampolsky. I mean, there's many, many techniques out there. Find one and use it. The emotional freedom technique, the five-minute phobia cure. There's a ton of technology that can, in like five minutes, you can get rid of a phobia. In five minutes, you can get rid of a negative belief, just tapping on certain meridian points. Things that we teach in our seminars, you can go into in greater depth. Be in a state of love. Always expect the positive. Always expect the positive. I basically gave Mark a little feedback. I mean, I think everything he said this morning, but once he, he said, oh, I don't think Al Gore will ever get 2.5 million people to watch that TV show. I said, Mark, that's a negative thought. Expect the positive. If you don't expect it, it won't happen. So you want to always be in that state of expecting that it's going to show up. Expecting it. I mean, how many of you would call Domino's Pizza, order your pizza, and then call them back and go, 
Are you guys really going to bring it over? You sure? You're not kidding me. Yeah, you really do that. Okay. You know, if you did that three or four times, they'd, they'd put your number on caller ID and they wouldn't take your call anymore. And yet we do that with the universe all the time. I'd like a Porsche. Oh, but I can't afford it. I'd like a Porsche, but you know, whatever. Now, probably more today we should say, I'd like a Prius instead of a Porsche, right? <laughs> We're all learning. Some of the things we've been trained to want aren't really the best things for us. And we have to learn some new, new stuff around that. All right, I'm going to skip over that slide. Here, I love this quote from Tiger Woods. He says, one of the things my dad kept instilling me was the joy of the game. He made it fun for me. A lot of times I see a lot of kids, they don't enjoy being out there. It's a shame. You're supposed to enjoy the game. I say the same thing about life. You're supposed to enjoy the game. One of the things I try to instill in my clinics is, yes, go out there and give it all you have, but more importantly, enjoy what you're doing. If you're not loving it, you know, all the teachers say, do what you love, the money will follow. Follow your passion, follow your heart. I don't know if Alan Cohen said this when he talked to you, but it was one of the things I learned in his book. Did he, did he mention this concept of hell yes or hell no? Yes. Yeah, that's a great idea. If it's not a hell yes, instantly it's called screw it. If you got to be going like, well, maybe, maybe not. Let me do, I'll make a list. These are the pros, these are the cons. If you didn't get an instant, yeah. I mean, when Lynn Twist, who started the Hunger Project, and I met her about a year ago, said, we bring people over to our chateau every summer, 16 people for a week. I just went. And she said, would you like to come? This year's our guest. And it was like, yeah, I want to come. It was like, well, let me talk to my wife, see if we can schedule it. As soon as you're doing that, it's like, it's not good. So you got to be following the excitement, following the juice. Mother Teresa once, she said, once I asked my counselor for advice about my vocation. I asked, how can I know if God is calling me and for what is he calling me? He answered, you'll know by your happiness. If you're happy, this will be the proof of your vocation. I think it was uh, Thomas Edison said, when your vocation becomes your vacation, then the rest of your life is a blessing. So you want to be doing the thing that you would do that you get paid for doing the thing you love to do. In my seminars, I'll have people make a list, 20 things you love to do. When I first did that exercise, I wrote, I love to hang out with really cool people. I love to hang out with intellectuals who are thinking cutting edge thoughts. I love to open my mail. I love to listen to music. Anyway, I went down my list. Then, then the, the, the seminar leader said, think of five ways you could make money doing that. I thought, how could I make money hanging out with really cool people? Well, one of the things I just did two years ago, I created something called the Transformational Leadership Council. We have 100 members of people like John Gray, who will be speaking to you tomorrow, and Gay Hendricks, who wrote all the books on relationships. And we get together twice a year for four days. And as a result of that, we have now co-ventured all kinds of cool things that have basically doubled my income in the last two years. And I'm hanging out with cool people. I'm making money doing the things I thought used to be what you got to do when you weren't working. So you want to keep following that passion. Now, Law of Attraction says believe. You've got to believe it's possible. Trust your internal guidance system. We've talked about that. I want to share with you a story about a guy named Cliff Young. Cliff Young was 61 years old when he showed up at the beginning of a long-distance race in Australia. The race was 875 kilometers. That's about 650 miles. He was wearing overalls. He was wearing construction boots. All the other guys were 25 or 30. They're all in their Adidas, Nike, Puma, A6 running gear. He looks like an old farmer. He actually had galoshes on over his boots, he says, in case of rain. They said, have you ever run a long distance race before? He said, no. So well, why do you think you can do this? Have you ever run a marathon? I mean, this is like six and a half days. He said, no, but I'm a farmer and I have to chase my sheep around and sometimes I have trouble and I have to chase them for two or three days and I don't seem to get tired. I think I can do it. He said, why don't you start with a shorter race? He said, well, this was the only days that were free on my schedule when it was a race scheduled. He said, okay. <laughs> so all the racers, the, the gun goes off and they all take off and they're really running fast. And Cliff's running like this. They called it the Cliff Young Shuffle. Now, Cliff had an advantage nobody knew about. Cliff had never talked to a coach. He'd never talked to an elite distance runner. He'd never read Runner's World magazine. He'd never read a book on long distance running. He didn't know that when you do a long distance race, you run for 18 hours, sleep for six, run for 18, 